right, good evening, everybody. Um, a warm welcome to you all. Thank you very much for coming um, to tonight's lecture, which is being hosted by uh, Wrexham Glyndor University and organised by North Wales for Europe. Goglev Cymru Dros Europe. The usual housekeeping business. Um, the facilities are back out through the door there, the toilets, and uh, turn right, and they're through the double doors. Uh, the bar is open and will be open till about nine o'clock-ish, so hopefully if we're out of here in time, there'll be time to have another drink. Um, as far as I'm aware, there's no fire alarm due, so the fire escape is one here, and then obviously out the, the double doors at the back there and out of the front of the building. Um, we don't have any simultaneous translation with us this evening, um, <coughs> but if you have questions that you want to ask in Welsh, um, there are Welsh speakers in the room and we'll do our best to get those translated and to, and to manage that in the best way that we can. The reason we don't have uh, simultaneous translation is because we're a voluntary group and we don't have funds, um, which is why we're selling merchandise and accepting uh, <coughs> donations outside. So I'm just going to do a brief-ish introduction to North Wales for Europe and, and then we'll move on. So who are we? we? We're a group of people that started meeting in February that who were... Um, across the political spectrum who were disappointed by what had happened with the referendum, to say the least. And we decided to come together and meet uh, to, to talk about that and to try and take some action. So we're a grassroots, cross-party and no-party organisation determined to secure the best deal for Wales with the UK, Europe and the rest of the world. It's only 15 pages, don't worry. Uh, it's our view that to depart from the European Union would threaten many interests vital to our country and to individual citizens, as well as to the interests of Europe as a whole. In or out of the EU, geography and all our current connections dictate that our economic, social, cultural and political relationships with the rest of Europe will remain a matter of primary importance. So as a group, we, we feel we must continue to protect the economy of Wales and the UK, trade, innovation, skills, jobs and growth through continued membership of the single market and the European Customs Union. Protect the current levels of EU investment in Wales and maintain the focus on reducing regional disparities beyond 2020. And protect dignity and equality within society, doing nothing that would undermine current EU-based employment and anti-discrimination rights. Continue to value talents and skills that our economy and educational and social systems need from wherever they may come, addressing social pressures where they occur and providing reassurance for citizens of other EU countries already residing here. I'm not going to carry on, but it goes on in that vein. And our aims and objectives are outside on the, on the, <coughs> on the table outside. We're all volunteers and we are putting on more and more events like this across North Wales, and we're keen to set up groups in other parts of North Wales. We meet at the moment in Colwyn Bay, but we'd be really keen to set up a group in Wrexham in the northeast, and over in the northwest, Bangor, Aberystwyth, wherever it may be. So if you are interested, please let us know after. Um, so moving on to the important bits. Um, thank you very much to Glyndora University for hosting this tonight. That's very kind of you. And we have here Professor Maria Hinfeller, the Vice Chancellor and Chief Executive of Wrexham Glyndor University. Uh, Maria is going to chair the event this evening. She's a Dutch national who has spent a significant number of years living and working in English speaking countries, both here and in Ireland. <coughs> and uh, this is a topic that is very close to our heart. So I'm going to hand over to Maria to continue the rest of the evening. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Silas, for that introduction. And uh, can I just echo Silas's welcome? Uh, welcome to the university, welcome to the event. Corozo i Baub, and I hope we will have a very interesting evening, and I'm sure we will, and hopefully also generate some good debate. Um, so what we're going to do, um, after my introduction, I'm going to just um, say a few words about our speaker, our keynote speaker for tonight, Michael, Professor Michael Duggan. After he is finished, um, the three of us are going to sit here at the front, and we're going to have a a discussion panel, a debate, and we would like to invite questions from the audience and comments and observations uh, and challenges uh, coming from all of you so we can have a lively debate. Um, but first, Professor Michael Duggan. He is a professor of European law and Jean Monnet chair in EU law with Liverpool University. 
Michael specializes in EU law, particularly EU constitutional law, the single market and EU welfare law. His work on the EU constitution and various EU institutions covers processes of constitutional reform, as well as the relationship between union law and the national legal systems. He has published widely on the EU's constitutional framework after the Lisbon Treaty, on the prin principle of direct effect of union law in national courts, and on the enforcement of union law. Current research interests include the problem of defining the scope of EU law and developments in flexibility, both within and beyond the EU treaties. And perhaps a next topic of interest um, for Professor Duggan's research might be how to transpose all of the EU laws into UK law and what you do with them subsequently and uh, all the unpicking there. That would be very interesting. Michael has also written extensively on single market law, especially the free movement of goods, persons and services and processes of harmonization of member state laws, which are of course part of the four freedoms that underpin um, the EU uh, and when it was first set up. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Michael. I'm going to sit back down and I'll be back later. Um, thanks very much indeed um, for the invitation um, to come here and, and speak this evening. I, I do actually spend a, a surprising amount of my life in, in North Wales, never for work, um, uh, just because, as I tell absolutely every new colleague who arrives to work at the law school in Liverpool, it is one of the most beautiful and most interesting parts of the whole of Europe, and it's always an absolute pleasure um, to, to come here. Um, now, the plan is that I'm going to talk for a little bit um, and then leave plenty of time for questions. And in my talk, I've been asked to, asked to cover sort of two main, um, two main topics. Um, first of all, a sort of introduction, a general overview to where we are at the moment, where we've got to. And secondly, a more focused discussion of the imminent negotiations between the UK and the EU, and in particular, our potential future relationship in trade terms to the single market. So I'll start with where we are um, at the moment. Um, now, to prepare for tonight, what I did was um, I actually went back to a lecture I gave in Liverpool nearly a year ago, not quite a year ago, nearly a year ago, um, a short time before the referendum, um, in which I tried to identify what the likely consequences from a constitutional lawyer's perspective would be of a victory um, for the Leave campaign. Now, at the time, those concerns were dismissed by Leave campaigners as Project Fear. I, I'm an EU propagandist who's paid by the EU to spread this type of rubbish. Um, but what struck me, I suppose, when I went back and looked um, at my old notes and updated them in the light of this evening is that things are pretty much unfolding um, exactly as myself and my colleagues predicted. Um, and indeed, as the rest of my colleagues across the UK and the rest of the EU predicted as well, because all of these things were very predictable. Um, I'll cover the four main things which we said were the likely consequences of a Leave victory. And the first was that a vote to Leave would trigger a comprehensive review of the UK legal system so as to prepare the UK for withdrawal. And the sheer scale and complexity of that review would inevit inevitably entail a massive delegation of power from Parliament to the executive. And more generally, that leaving the EU would remove the EU's regulatory safety nets that prevent any government minded to do so with one extra MEP in Parliament and its opposition um, to simply deregulate standards for workers, the environment, consumers and so on at will. So what has happened? Well, I'm not sure if any of you who actually looked at the great repeal bill white paper which was published in April of 2017 but yes indeed we will be having a comprehensive review of the entire UK legal system to prepare the UK with withdrawal and it will confer wide-ranging far-reaching part upon the government to rewrite UK law as well as a major program of primary legislation so as to construct entirely new UK regimes across whole fields and sectors of our economy and society for example customs agriculture and immigration and if anyone pays any attention to the anti-red tip campaigns, which are now being organised by the likes of the Daily Telegraph and supported by senior conservatives, um, you'll realise, of course, that short-term manifesto promises about maintaining workers' rights or protecting the environment actually don't count for very much anymore in the new reality that's coming towards the UK constitutional system. And that's not just because U-turns seem to be the political manoeuvre of the day, it's because the entire structure of the way that we regulate our, our economy and society will change when we leave the EU, and it will be open to any future government to deregulate those fields as and when it will. So first prediction, well, pretty much on course. 
Second prediction, um, a vote to leave could lead to radical changes in the constitutional um, settlement of the UK. It might increase the likelihood of a second referendum on independence in Scotland, and it could create serious problems for Northern Ireland, especially concerning the border with the Republic. Well, again, it's fairly difficult to say that those predictions aren't coming true on a more or less daily basis. We know that Nicola Sturgeon and the Scottish Parliament have formally asked for approval to hold a second Scottish referendum. And even if that um, is not forthcoming from Westminster, um, I was in Edinburgh just, just a few days ago, and I can say um, quite, qu I was really quite surprised at the level of resentment and anger that there is towards the way that Scotland is being treated in the course of these unfolding uh, political developments. And as for Northern Ireland, everyone agrees now, um, uh, th those who hadn't realised it before, that Northern Ireland is the region of the UK that will be most damaged by leaving the EU, just as Ireland as a member state is the country which will be most damaged by the UK's departure. Um, and the border issue is now top of the political agenda, um, uh, and not least for the EU itself. So again, predictions fairly on course. Third set of predictions, what will happen with our relations with the rest of the EU? Well, we uh, speculated um, in an informed way um, that there would be negotiations on an agreement dealing with the mechanics of withdrawal, issues like citizens' rights and so on, and the possibility of a future framework agreement on trade relations in particular, but you can only conclude that trade agreement after the UK has already left the EU and it will take a lot longer than two years to do. And in the meantime, we might be forced to fall back on the minimalist rules of the WTO, which every credible commentator, and I stress the word credible, um, regards as deeply unsatisfactory, if not potentially very damaging. Now, given that this is actually the main item uh, that we're going to talk about tonight, I'll come back to it in more detail. But as I always tell my PhD students, law is not a murder mystery. It doesn't have a plot that you unveil at the end of your lecture. You set it out up front. Um, this is exactly what is happening as we speak. Um, and the only people who don't seem to have quite grasped it yet, unfortunately for all of us, are the UK government. Now, the fourth um, prediction that we made comes to relations with the rest of the world, and we identified a series of challenges which the UK would have to deal with. For example, the loss of all of our existing trade agreements, several dozen of them covering many, many countries, which were negotiated on our behalf by the EU. We would need to urgently build capacity in our uh, ability to carry out highly specialised international negotiations and represent ourselves at highly specialised um, international uh, uh, trade deals. Um, we would probably see our bargaining power as a non-member of the single market reduced um, compared to what we have as a full member of the single market, able to marshal the resources of 500 million relatively rich consumers in the world economy. And we'd also take the risk that countries would want to see how our bilateral and regional trade situation would pan out before they became willing to engage in more advanced trade deals with us. Now, to be fair, it's still a little bit too early to watch these particular predictions um, unfold because even though the vote to leave was nearly a year ago, not actually very much happened on this front um, until fairly recently. But even just over the last couple of weeks, we've learned some telling things. First of all, the EU has confirmed that as far as it's concerned, we are out of all of those trade agreements. And bearing in mind that we need the full consent of the rest of the EU in order to try and remain party to any existing trade agreements, that's it. That die is, that die is cast and that decision has been made. Um, so much for taking back control. Um, the uh, African, Caribbean and Pacific countries um, have already recently said that they really deeply resent the UK's quite arrogant bluster about its Empire 2.0 trade policy and have effectively told the UK government to get a grip on reality. Um, and even Donald Trump, and I don't use those words often, even <laughs> Donald Trump, um, we hear through reports in newspapers like The Guardian but also in the BBC, um, is coming to the conclusion that the UK isn't actually up to serious trade negotiations for the time being, and maybe it's time to go back and talk to the EU as they were before under Barack Obama. Now, all of that is just what we've learned in the last couple of weeks alone, but it really does take place against the very worrying background of what uh, Theresa May and her Chancellor, Philip Hammond, have been threatening over the past couple of months, which is that if the UK doesn't get its way on the international trade scene, then they reserve the right to turn us into a low tax, low productivity, low public service um, economy, basically a modern day sweatshop. Um, that, that is the global Britain, which we've been told is the reserve option if we don't get our way on the international trade scene. 
So in a way, events are unfolding um, in a way that was entirely predictable, that was actively predicted, um, but enough by way of general context. Let's then turn our attention to the imminent negotiations between the UK and the rest of the EU, and in particular, the prospects for a future trade agreement. Now, we should start by recalling, of course, that there are actually three distinct, if interrelated, sets of negotiations which are going to be undertaken. And the first set are the uh, trying to reach an agreement on the mechanics of withdrawal. Now, there are three major issues which the EU has said will be given priority. The rights of current migrants, of financial settlement, of um, rights, obligations and liabilities, and the border issue involving Ireland and Northern Ireland. But there are, they're not the only ones. There's actually a list of about, depending on how you count them, about 15 or 16 issues which the EU has said need to be sorted out as a priority. For example, what do you do with the hundreds of pending judicial and possibly thousands of pending administrative um, proceedings involving EU law, EU operators? How do we transfer the European Banking Authority and the European Medicines Agency smoothly out of London into their new homes, wherever those homes might be? How do we disentangle the UK from the Eurotom system and the entire international regime on the regulation of nuclear materials? So that's the first bundle of issues, the mechanics of withdrawal, a whole series of quite difficult and important problems. The second set of negotiations um, will be on the framework for future relations, most obviously in trade, but also in a host of other fields as well. For example, cross-border cooperation in the field of crime, um, broader security and defence cooperation, environmental cooperation, research, technology and so on. And the third and final set of negotiations, negotiations on potential transitional provisions. How do we help ease the shock of leaving the EU and move towards um, a new set of regimes without causing undue disruption to individuals, to businesses, to other organisations. Now, everybody around the table agrees that those are the three main sets of negotiations that have to be undertaken. The major disagreements have already um, emerged over the relationship and the timing of those three sets of negotiations. Now, on the one hand, the UK government's position, which was set out um, by Theresa May um, before Christmas, after Christmas, is now enshrined in a white paper, has been repeated in virtually every major policy document since, including the Conservative Party manifesto, is that the government wants all of these agreements to be finalised, concluded, signed off within a period of about 18 months, so they're all in place by the time the UK leaves, and then the transitional provisions will merely be about implementing the new agreements um, after withdrawal. By contrast, the EU's clear and position, uh, consistent position, which was set out before the referendum, immediately after the referendum, has been repeated on a virtually weekly basis since the referendum, is no, 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 you don't get it. Um, first of all, we deal with the mechanics of withdrawal. And then, if sufficient progress is made on these already very complex and sensitive issues, then and only then do we begin preliminary and preparatory discussions on the outlines of a future relationship. But that future relationship can only be progressed and finalised and concluded after you've left the EU. In the meantime, we're prepared to consider, says the EU, certain transitional provisions to help ease the shock of withdrawal. But these will be essentially the prolongation of existing EU regulatory regimes as they apply in the UK, not the first implementation of a non-existent agreement, because there won't be any agreement. Now, that position was confirmed by the European Council in its negotiating guidelines in early April 2017. Um, as of this week, it is now law because it's now been enacted by the Council of Ministers in the formal negotiating directives for the European Commission. The die, again, is now cast. Now, to be absolutely clear, this EU position has not been dreamt up on a whim. It has not been designed to punish Little Britain. It is what the treaties say have to happen. And every single EU constitutional lawyer I know has been saying the same thing for a very long time. Um, this is not punishing poor Britain by making life difficult. This is the way the EU works. And any government minister who'd bothered to read the treaties would have known this as well. Secondly, it's also the only interpretation which offers a realistic experience-based understanding of how international negotiations actually work. Let's not forget that it will have taken the UK nearly 12 months just to be in a position internally that we can even start negotiations with the EU. Again, I haven't met a single person outside the sort of weird parallel um, uh, universe occupied by UK Leave campaigners um, who actually believe 
that the government's time scale is in any way credible or deliverable. Most people just think it's completely bonkers. Yet the degree to which the UK position not just contradicts the EU's understanding, but contradicts widespread international experience, um, isn't just bonkers, it's also potentially very, very dangerous, if not damaging, because the government's position is central to its entire negotiating strategy as set out in its white paper. A whole series of key objectives about how the government plans to manage this country are dependent upon the government being right and everyone else in the world being wrong. Put simply, it's been clear for a very long time already that we will be leaving the EU without any proper deal on future relations in place, and it should have been on that absolutely clear and critical basis that the government constructed its own neg negotiating strategy and advised, just importantly, advised individuals, businesses, other types of organisations to prepare for what actually is coming next, what they wish is coming next. Um, it has to be said, the UK at the minute doesn't have a credible negotiating strategy, and it's only now, I think, as I'm travelling around the country doing a lot of talks, meeting a lot of people, it's only now that a lot of businesses and organisations are beginning to realise that they probably shouldn't have believed what the government said, um, and are now starting to put together their plans for what's actually going to happen. Um, Michelle Barnier, regardless of what else you might think of the man or not, was absolutely right at the start of this week to say the UK's transitional period actually started on the 30th of March 2019 and the time to do your preparations is now. Now instead, we're wasting another six weeks having a general election, which is basically a, an exercise in political vanity, um, and the government is still telling people that they're confident that they're going to have a full trade deal within 18 months. It's not only misleading, it's positively reckless. Now against that already quite complicated, not very promising background, let's set aside the question of the withdrawal mechanics, let's set aside the question of the transitional arrangements, let's focus in on the issue of future trade relations between the UK and the EU. Now when it comes to any potential trade agreement, um, there, are, there are basically a checklist of fundamental issues that people like me work our way through for a living. Um, they need to be crystallised, each party has to have a very clear understanding of what it is they want to get out of this agreement, they need to be negotiated in laborious detail, and they need to be agreed upon and ratified by both sides. Um, and I'll just run through the checklist um, uh, so, as you, so as you know what, what, what it is that we're thinking about. First of all, you've got to define the scope and the fields of cooperation. Is it going to be for goods? Is it going to be all goods or only certain categories of goods, manufactured, agricultural, fisheries and so on? Will it cover services? And if so, which services will it cover? Will it cover legal persons? Will it cover the rights of establishment of companies? How far will it cover natural persons? But what will be the basic scope and fields of cooperation? Within each and every single one of those fields of cooperation, what depth of economic integration do you want to achieve? Is it going to be limited to guaranteeing non-discrimination between your products and my products, basically not going very much beyond what the WTO does already? Or are you going to seek to tackle the fundamental problem of international trade between developed economies, which is non-tariff regulatory barriers to trade that arise through differences in the way that different jurisdictions regulate goods and services? Or do you want to go even further and try to create a more genuinely integrated economic zone akin to a single market? Now again, within each and every single one of those fields, which instruments do you want to use in order to realise your chosen ambition for cooperation. For example, if you are going to tackle non-tariff barriers, do you want to do so through the harmonisation of laws? Do you want to establish common standards between the parties? Or will you be content with mutual recognition of equivalent standards? They're different, but they're more or less the same, and as long as we recognise each other's standards, we can live with the consequences. Or are you not really going to achieve either of those things? Will you rely more on forms of administrative cooperation and, and information sharing between your national authorities? How far will the parties insist upon the need for flanking policies so as to prevent unfair competition? And those flanking policies are both direct. You have to have policies which seek to prevent artificial distortions of trade between the two sides to the agreement arising from either public or private conduct. So that raises questions about competition law, the rules on cartels and monopolies. It raises questions about state aid restrictions. How far might you take the risk that your other contracting party artificially subsidises its industries in a way which will distort competition. How far will you have rules on public procurement? Will you 
insist that the way that your public bodies open up contracts for goods and services also have to comply with these competitive rules. And it also covers indirect flanking policies. How far will you allow each contracting party to seek to gain artificial advantages in competition by engaging in regulatory races to the bottom, seeking to lower wages, lower social standards in order to attract migrant um, capital, migrant companies. So that covers employment, the environment, consumers, public health, and so on. Which institutional arrangements will you seek in order to operationalize the agreement? Um, you'll need political institutions that will help make decisions, that will elaborate and update what is effectively still only a skeleton agreement that needs to be fleshed out in practice. What structures will you have for the effective implementation and enforcement of your obligations? And in particular, what dispute settlement mechanisms will you agree upon? And will those dispute mechanisms be limited to the states at the international level, or will they also be available in some shape or form to individuals and businesses on the ground within your national legal system? And finally, you've got to make sure that the proposed agreement is compatible with your existing obligations, both your internal obligations, with the way your own constitutional structure works, the way your own institutions are set out, and also your external commitments. For example, you have to still comply with WTO law. Now that's the basic, basic, basic checklist um, that, that, that we expect to work through when we're looking at international trade agreements. And the question arises, how much do we know so far about what the UK wants from the EU? And the answer is virtually nothing. On the UK side, the government's position, again set out in the white paper, um, makes three points which are relevant to what we're talking about here. And the first point is, um, the UK policy towards our future relations with the rest of Europe is being dictated by two of the main lies and fantasies which were sold to the British public by the charlatans and demagogues of the Leave campaign. First of all, hostility towards EU immigration, and secondly, hostility towards the European Court of Justice. And in particular, it's those twin factors taken together which are entirely dictating the future relationship between the UK and the EU, and in particular, which lay the basis for seriously dislocating our future relations with the EU well into the future. To be more precise, the white paper um, focuses a lot on the alleged problems caused by EU immigration and insists that the UK needs to take back control over EU immigration by introducing controls on the number of EU nationals who take up residency in the UK. Now, the government's presentation of what EU law actually says is very misleading. Um, they don't provide any supporting evidence for their claims. On the contrary, every serious social science study on the impact of EU migration upon the UK um, contradicts what the government is saying. Um, they refuse to acknowledge at any point the central role that was placed, play, played by UK policy, UK choices, UK institutions in the law and practice of free movement, particularly the enlargement into Eastern Europe and the fact that the UK decided to allow and in fact encourage migration from Eastern Europe to the UK for purely economic reasons. And it also of course overlooks the basic and glaring fact that at the last census the great majority of foreign nationals living in the UK were not from the EU and they are entirely within the competence of the UK government and institutions. Um, and so if we're going to blame anyone for immigration problems such as they are, um, we only really have ourselves to blame. Secondly, um, the white paper focuses on the need for the UK to escape the jurisdiction of the Court of Justice. But again, they fail to provide any explanation or evidence to support their allegation that the European Court of Justice is somehow a dysfunctional institution. And that's unsurprising, given that any ideological motivated uh, critique of the Court of Justice inevitably relies on a highly selective and distorted degree of evidence um, to support its um, or decisions that it's already made about itself. It's one of those sort of ironies, of course, that for every right-wing person who attacks the European Court of Justice as being a left-wing institution that seeks to undermine the nation state and advance European integration, there'll be a more left-wing person who criticizes the Court of Justice for being too deferential to the member states and not doing enough to promote the interests of the EU. Um, all of these critiques are selective, distorted, they rely on their own self-serving evidence, and ultimately none of them are particularly persuasive. 
The government, of course, does nothing as well to acknowledge that actually the UK, behind the scenes, as always, has been one of the great champions of the Court of Justice. It was the UK that actively promoted the idea that the court should have the power to pursue and fine member states who didn't play by the rules because it suits the UK's interests, because the UK wants other states to play by the rules. And of course, it fails to acknowledge that compared to most other systems of international dispute settlement, um, the European Court of Justice actually does a very good job, um, especially when you compare it to an institution like the WTO. Anybody who complains about transparency, democracy, legitimacy or accountability and then refers to the WTO really knows nothing about the WTO. Now, the white paper, therefore, the starting point that we have to accept is that this is uh, the translation of europhobia into national policy and it will decide this country's future for generations to come. It's worth noting, of course, that while the government's um, entire policy towards the future relations with the single market is based on these twin narratives constructed by the Leave campaign, um, virtually everything else in the white paper manages to contradict um, what the Leave campaign claimed. For example, the white paper says very clearly that at no point during the past 40 odd years was parliamentary sovereignty ever in danger as a result of our EU membership. They um, go on to say that the main objective of uh, UK policy should be to continue to secure all of the many advantages of EU membership, even though we're leaving. And the strangest thing of all, I suppose, is that the, 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 the white paper and in virtually every other document the government produces talks about the greatness of the UK in economic terms, diplomatic terms, cult cultural terms and so on, begging the rather, rather awkward question, well, if the last 40 years the UK um, has been a member of the EU, how did we manage to be so great when the EU was systematically destroying us? Because that's what we've been told for the past 40 years as well. The two simply don't add up. But the bottom line is, this is what we're stuck with. So from there, second main point of the white paper, um, when it comes to the future of our relations, uh, the white paper says we are leaving the customs union. Now this was obvious, this was obvious to anyone who was listening because membership of a customs union carries very extensive regulatory obligations and it carries significant limitations on your ability to engage in trade relations with the outside world. Instead, what the government says is we want a special relationship with the customs union. We can't tell you what it is, we have no idea what it might look like, but we want a special relationship with the customs union. Now it's pretty easy to say that. I imagine you ask every country in the world what they'd like and they'd say we'd like a special relationship with the customs union. But of course, again, it answers none of the key questions that we um, identified above. For example, what will be the scope of this customs union, um, customs agreement? Um, so far, the only indications we get from the UK government are incompatible with the WTO. They talk about special deals for the car industry or so on. You can't have those. You can't have special deals under the WTO. Um, probably the biggest problem is that even with a very extensive customs agreement, even if there were zero tariffs as there are today on all goods between the UK and the EU, that would not obviate the need for the two systems to apply the rules of origin. In other words, you've got to be able to identify your goods from any other goods which happen to be in your territory, which you didn't make. Because the idea is that you can only offer those special fiscal privileges to your goods, not to any other third country goods that happen to be in your territory. So even if the UK got the best deal possible, and it would be a better deal than any other country, that was a bit Donald Trump-like, wasn't it? It would still be the, <laughs> great, um, it would still be the, the best deal, the best deal um, imaginable, um, better than any other country on the planet has managed to get before. We'd still have to have pre and customs formalities, we still have to have customs checks, customs borders, precisely the issues which cause such trouble for Northern Ireland and the Republic. And I imagine if I were working at the Holyhead port, I would be um, having serious headaches about this as well. Third point, leaving the single market, we are leaving the single market, even as members of the European Economic Area, let alone as member states of the European Union. Now again, this has been obvious for clearly quite some time to anyone who was paying attention. You can't be a member of the single market and not accept the full free movement of people. And membership of the single market without membership of the EU comes at a very heavy political price. You're basically saying we'll take all of your rules and just swallow them and we don't have any influence over them. It would be absolute madness for a country like the UK, one of the main players in the European Union, to simply become a passive recipient of EU law. Of course, that didn't stop most of the leading Leave campaigners at some point or another promising that leaving the EU wouldn't have this effect. 
but never mind, that's what we're stuck with. Instead, the government wants to replicate um, many of the uh, systems that apply in the single market through a non-single market treaty, a free trade agreement that would cover goods, services, capital, legal persons, some natural persons. But again, there is simply no indication in any of the available documentation of what the UK has in mind here. They can't define the scope of the agreement. They can't talk about the depth of integration that they have as their ambition. They have no particular idea the instruments of cooperation that they want to use. They say very little about the political, administrative or judicial structures that would be required to operationalise it. All we know is we don't want the full free movement of natural persons and we don't want the European Court of Justice. And that's pretty much all that we know. Now again, it's very easy to say we want an ambitious trade agreement. Every country in the world says it, possibly not North Korea, but every country in the world says this. But on virtually every key issue that would need to be addressed, we know almost nothing. Now the almost complete lack of detail is all the more striking when one bears in mind several crucial contextual factors which again we really need to bear in mind here. And the first is that the UK cannot simply wish away the inherent problems of international trade, especially the challenge of non-tariff regulatory barriers in to, to trade in goods and services. It remains shockingly common to hear many uh, of the leading Leave campaigners, many of them also now government ministers, talk about trade agreements in terms which seem to have no comprehension beyond tariffs. And even that, they usually manage to get wrong. Um, they seem to be either completely oblivious or, or willfully blind to the real difficulties which are involved in international trade. Secondly, the UK isn't seeking to prize open a market which has been closed to it before. The UK is seeking to minimise disruption, minimise the loss of market access, minimise the damage to its economy by leaving a market with which it is already extensively integrated. In less than two years' time, the regulatory conditions for UK companies to do business across Europe and vice versa will become substantially less favourable than they are at the minute. They will actively create a vast array of trade barriers which we don't have at the moment and at the very best that will increase costs for business, at the very worst it will simply de facto seal off markets which are currently open to us. And thirdly, what the UK is asking for in international trade terms is completely novel and unprecedented. The UK is asking for something which no other country in the history of international trade has managed to achieve. And, and again, the UK government seems to have very little um, realisation that, that there are no precedents for what it is we're asking for, let alone the timescales we have in mind. So much for the UK <laughs> government position. Um, how has the EU then reacted to these demands? Well, the European Council guidelines from April 2017 say a little bit about future trade relations, not very much because obviously this is something which will only be done in the future. The EU welcomes and shares the desire for a close partnership, stresses that it can't, obviously can't offer the same benefits as membership, but does recognise that there's a common interest in strong and constructive ties. Any trade agreement with the UK should be balanced, it should be ambitious, it should be wide-ranging, but it cannot amount to de facto participation either in the single market as a whole or parts of the single market. It has to ensure a level playing field, it has to contain rules on competition and state aid, it has to safeguard against unfair competition through tax, social, regulatory and other environmental standards. It has to include appropriate enforcement and dispute settlement mechanisms, but it can't allow the UK to interfere in the autonomy of the EU's own decision-making processes or institutions. In other words, you're not sitting at our table with us. And finally, the only bit that wasn't a surprise, but again, not that much of a surprise if you think about it, um, no agreement between the EU and the UK can apply to Gibraltar without the agreement of Spain. Now, in large part, these principles confirm pretty much what we've all said about EU trade policy for many, many years, because these aren't about the UK, these are about EU trade policy. Um, and the experience of that trade policy throws up another couple of points that we should bear in mind. First of all, formally, being outside the EU makes you look like you have greater regulatory autonomy, greater sovereignty, if you want to put it in those terms. But in practice, if you want to have privileged access to somebody else's market and they're bigger than you are, you have to follow their rules. So the theory of regulatory independence and the reality of regulatory dependence are very different from each other. 
Secondly, privileged access to the single market, if it is to be meaningful, means not just copying and pasting rules as they exist in a particular period of time, it means guaranteeing that you will constantly and immediately update your national legal system so as to track developments in your major partner's rules as well. And that is the experience of EU law. And thirdly, if you want privileged access to someone else's market, you pay for it. You have to pay a fee like everybody else. Now, is there any of this new or surprising? Of course not. It's all um, entirely predicted, entirely predictable. And it's unfortunate, I suppose, that there's been so little appreciation by, by leading Leave campaigners, but also um, by the government, of the simple fact that international cooperation does involve a balance of rights and obligations. And it does include participation in political, administrative, judicial structures that constrain and condition your national autonomy. And the UK government is going to discover that even the British, even the British, um, aren't exempt from the two fundamental axioms that we talk about in the field of international trade relations. First of all, the ambition of an international trade agreement is conditioned primarily by the willingness of the parties to agree appropriate institutional arrangements. Institutional arrangements are key to the type of international trade agreement that you get because you have to create mutual trust between your respective institutions so as to make the system function. The more ambitious the deal, the more extensive the obligations, the more the institutional structures required to make those obligations work in practice, and the less your national autonomy actually means very much in practice. Second axiomatic principle in international trade, size matters. Bigger players set the rules. It's so obvious, isn't it? It's, it's so obvious, and yet we have pretended that it doesn't happen like that. Um, they set the rules at the global level. The big international organizations that dictate the development of the world economy are dominated, like it or not, by America, Europe, and increasingly China. And they set the rules at the bilateral level. Big markets determine the terms of access of smaller markets. And if the smaller markets don't like it, they don't get the access that they wanted. Size matters in international trade. Now, unfortunately, this lack of understanding isn't limited to the likes of Nigel Farage or Gisela Stewart. It's been actively promoted, actively encouraged by the likes of Boris Johnson, Liam Fox, and now also by Theresa May. The Prime Minister keeps saying that she wants the UK to be one of the great champions, the global champions of free trade. We're going to strike ambitious trade deals, not just with the EU, but with the rest of the world as well. Yet at the same time, we are going to retain our full national sovereignty. We will not subject ourselves to external constraints or institutions. These two things are simply incompatible with each other. Trade deals always mean accepting restrictions, um, often very extensive restrictions on your sovereignty. They always entail a degree of external control and influence, especially where there is unequal bargaining power. They always have profound impacts upon your domestic law and they inevitably involve subjugation to some form of external arbitral or judicial authority. Being a champion of free trade and having full national sovereignty is simply an oxymoron. Now, a, a few people as they come in sort of said to me, um, I, ho I hope you're going to end on an optimistic note and on a positive <laughs> note. <laughs> um, well, well, I'll do my best. I'll do my best. I've hastily scribbled some positive things for us all to reflect upon. But they're positive more in a determined way than a sort of wildly happy, good, sort of a, a swivel-eyed way. Um, we'll, we'll leave that, we'll leave that to, to you, Kip. Um, as a starting proposition, the starting proposition um, is, is quite important and we should never either forgive or forget it because we should neither forgive nor forget how a bunch of charlatans and demagogues set out to con, trick and frighten as many millions of people as they possibly could into subjecting themselves to what was essentially an ideological fixation. Um, and that is always the starting point that I'm going to carry on the rest of my career, the rest of my life as its basis. But at the same time, there is no point at all being consumed by resentment, being uh, taken over by anger, or shrugging your shoulders and thinking, ah, well, okay, sarah, sarah. Um, th there's actually quite a lot of work to be done, and I think this is the positive bit. There's a lot of work that needs to be done now, and I'll just highlight three main challenges. First challenge is to hold the Leave campaigners to account. Hold them to account for the promises that they made. Hold them to account for the things that they denied would ever happen. Hold them account for the problems they said would never materialize. These people made a lot of promises and they denied a lot of things and we need to make sure that they take responsibility for that. 
Secondly, in particular, we need to make sure that they take responsibility and they don't shove it onto the shoulders of everybody else, either people like me or many of the people I suppose in this room, anyone who dares to express a contrary opinion and is immediately shouted down as undemocratic, anti-patriotic, a traitor, an enemy of the people, or just as importantly, onto the shoulders of the EU. It made my blood boil to hear Theresa May try to justify her vanity election by blaming it all on the interference of foreigners. That was cynical and disgusting. But that's exactly a challenge that we must um, fight back against. Responsibility for what happens belongs with the people who made this mess and them alone. And the third challenge is to be vigilant against a whole set of other problems which are going to come our way very quickly because there is a depressing correlation between many of the leading Leave campaigners and a whole series of other anti-rational movements such as climate change denial and regressive socio-economic preferences, for example, by seeing workers' rights as nothing more than some sort of red tip that needs to be swept away, by treating equality rights as PC gone mad, that we must free ourselves so we can bigot it as we like, because that's what we all really want to be. These people have other agendas, and leaving the EU is going to be a massive step in their favour to realise these other agendas. Now, in terms of tackling these challenges, I think I probably have two main pieces of advice. And the first one is never to say, never to utter the words, I feel ashamed to be British. For the very simple reason, it somehow suggests that these people have a monopoly on what it means to be British and they represent what this country is about. They don't. They had a narrow majority in a referendum. They do not represent what this country is all about. And secondly, and that I, I, that comment actually brings me on to my second main point. We should distinguish very carefully between the leading Leave campaigners and, it has to be said, their, 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 their compact sort of zombie army of swivel-eyed loons who do get on the internet on a regular basis to screech their abuse at anyone who dares to express a contrary opinion. And the vast majority of people in this country who happened to vote Leave, they are as much the victims of this contract as anybody else is. They are decent, good people who want the best for their country, want the best for their society and for their families. They were conned, tricked and frightened into supporting a political ideology and they are as much the victims as any of the rest of us. And so ultimately, for those who do believe that the values and interests of the UK and the EU are aligned, that we share much more in common than we have as differences, and that we will have to work patiently um, to win public support for the UK rejoining its rightful place at the heart of the European Union. I think the task is that we just have to work hard and work patiently. It might be two years, it might be 20, it might be five years, it might be 50, but the job is to get back into the EU. And I think that's the job that needs to be done. Um, it's not about optimism, it's really about determination. I've probably spoken for too long, but the, the optimistic bit um, had to be added in. Thank you very much for your attention, and I look forward um, to your questions. Absolutely fascinating and uh, a huge amount to, to mull over, a huge amount to take in, uh, very impressive and uh, very provocative uh, at times as well and some very interesting thoughts at the end, um, which I know you were uh, frantically trying to scribble away about 10 minutes before you were due to speak. <laughs> um, and which actually dealt with the first question from the audience because they, are, they were asking you as people were on their way in. So um, I would now like to open it up and uh, invite questions and comments and observations. So who would like to be first? Oh, we have a roving mic as well. <laughs> so if you've got a question, if you could please wait for the mic to arrive before yes. you speak. Eventually, we do. The ultimate aim has to be to rejoin the EU. I mean, I think the big difference in the refer referendum was seeing the age differences. You see, the 60 plus the most Eurosceptic, 18 to 24 the most 
most pro Europe, seemed to be at the age of around sort of mid 30s, you became more likely to be a leaver than a remainer. I think certainly in the future we will become a lot more. I think a lot of people will be warm a lot more to the you know to the idea of rejoining the EU. So, I guess my question is that um, at the moment, over the years, we've settled some you know major things with Europe. We've got our way multiple times. We've got the rebate. We're not in Schengen. <coughs> we're uh, not in the euro. So that, you know massive things that you know. Un incredibly you know, unlikely to get those things in the first place. My question is that in a few decades' time, if we do say we want to rejoin, what do you think the likelihood is that we could have any, any special treatment apart from you know, re-signing ECHR, joining the Euro, joining Schengen, paying massive, massively more amounts of money to the European budget? Uh, it's, a really, it's a really, really excellent question. Um, the, 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 it's, a, it's a very complicated answer in the sense that there's lots of facets because um, lots of pieces are now moving, aren't they, um, in, uh, on the chess set. Um, I think there's a couple of questions we should ask. The first one is, we, we have no idea what we might want to rejoin. And so although it's, it's actually quite easy sort of for me to say, you know, well, we'll get back in there in 20, 30 years' time. Actually, we're leaving. And that means that one of the main veto players in the system, which has prevented the EU from evolving along directions that other member states would like it to evolve, is being eliminated. And that means that we no longer have any control over how the EU might evolve, and we have no idea what the EU might become. Um, you might all remember that a few months ago, the French and Germans came out with some proposals for greater cooperation in the field of European defence. They could never even have dreamt of bringing those proposals forward if they hadn't sensed that our veto power was already dead and on its way out formally. So I think that's a major qualification to what I said, maybe to your question. We don't know what the EU will become. Now, the European Commission published a white paper on the future of Europe just a few months ago, which sets out various scenarios for how the EU might evolve. And it is very deliberately intended to stimulate a political discussion upon the member states with an eye to future treaty reform. Um, the election of Emmanuel Macron, one of the first things he said was, I think we need a treaty reform, don't you? Um, obviously thinking, well, the UK is going. The UK effectively killed treaty reform in Europe. As soon as they're out of the way, let's sit down and start thinking about it again. So I think that's the first big qualification. We don't know what's going to happen yet. But if we sort of work on the basis that actually most member states have no interest whatsoever in federalization, if anything, it, there'll be greater flexibility, not less flexibility built into the system is, is the most likely prediction. Um, if we work with what we had as a very good deal, a unique deal as a member state, and how far we might want to replicate it, there are basically two challenges. And the first one is the euro. Um, and the second one you rightly mentioned is Schengen. Now, in a way, the euro isn't such a big deal. Um, we have an opt-out. Denmark has an opt-out. We had no formal obligation ever to join the single currency, and we were happy with that. But there are lots of other member states which are formally obliged to join the single currency and have no intention of ever doing it for a very long time. And the main example is Sweden. So Sweden joined the EU. It joined the EU at a time when the EU said any future member state has to sign up to the single currency. The Swedes said, yes, of course we will. And as soon as they got in, they said, by the way, we're never joined in the euro unless we have a national referendum in which our population approves that we join the euro. And we don't care about any of the rest of it because you can't force us. And of course, that's true. So strictly speaking, the obligation to join the euro is politically, it's a difficult sell because of course you're saying to your own public, we're signing up to this on paper, but in practice, nobody can force you and nobody can require you to. Um, Nicola Sturgeon, by the way, is very aware of this in terms of a future independent Scotland. Schengen is more difficult in the sense that Schengen, um, the treaties as they're currently structured say very explicitly, it's Article 7 of Protocol 19, I think, if you really want the reference, um, actually explicitly say any member state that wants to join the EU in the future, any aspiring member state, must sign up to the Schengen Agreement in full. Um, and given that Article 50 says any member state that leaves when it seeks to rejoin, will be treated like any other country in the world who wants to join. In principle, that will apply to the UK as well. 
Now that's a major obstacle, but it's not an insurmountable one because those provisions were written at a time when the only countries that might want to join the EU were all going to have a land border with the EU. It was going to be Eastern European countries that were inevitably going to be neighbours to Schengen territories. That won't be the case in the future for the UK. We'll still be an island, it's not going to change. And so the rationale behind that provision doesn't actually apply to the UK or to that matter to an independent Scotland. Um, so it would be relatively easy for the UK politically to make the case that they just need to exempt us from that treaty provision. You just change it and say, you know, notwithstanding Article 7 of Protocol 19, the UK does not have to join Schengen. Given that Ireland will remain in the EU and not part of Schengen with the common travel area with the UK, it just makes sense. It makes complete sense. <laughs> so lots of uncertainty, but on the two big issues that you mentioned, I, I don't see them as insurmountable obstacles. Thank you. Yes. Uh, the lady, at the lady, lady right at the back. Can you just, get, just wait a second, because we for the um, for the live stream, we do need the microphone there. <laughs> it's not long enough. I, I appreciate that you're a lawyer, not an economist. Uh, it seems to me that the additional austerity package in Greece is creating an unsustainable situation. Um, I don't know what will happen next but I don't think the situation we have now can continue. Um, would you care to comment on the impact of Greece's role in the EU on these issues? I, I, I know very little about economic and monetary union. Um, I know very little about economics. I, if one of the main messages that I've been trying to get out over the past year or so is people who don't know what they're talking about shouldn't have strong opinions about it. Um, I, I don't think it's very appropriate for me to answer the question. What's happening in Greece is, is, is extremely unfortunate, extremely unfortunate. But I think it's worth bearing in mind, and I'm not expressing any view here because I have no particular view on this as an academic, that very different people have very different perspectives on what's happened in Greece. Um, and for every... Um, Eurozone lawyer I know who says this is unnecessary austerity which is being imposed upon Greece, they really need to lighten up and change the way that they're dealing with Greece. I meet another Eurozone lawyer who says the Greeks shouldn't have defrauded their way into the single currency, the Greeks shouldn't have defrauded their books consistently throughout the financial <laughs> crisis and they can't expect other people to pay for them. This is a a problem on which reasonable people can hold very, very different views. My own views are that I don't know enough about it to justify having a strong opinion. Um, my only hope is that they manage to sort it out sooner rather than later for the sake of the people of Greece, not really for anyone else. The gentleman with the red t-shirt, I think, was next, and then after that the gentleman next, next to him. In the common travel area with Ireland and the islands, where do you think that's going to go? Okay, um, th th this is one of those issues which um, uh, Ireland has actually scored quite a major diplomatic triumph in the past couple of weeks. Um, there, were, there were two problems with the maintenance of the common travel area um, which had sort of arisen since the referendum campaign, before it as well, because none of these things weren't foreseen. Um, one is that there was an argument which primarily came from the UK and was endorsed, unfortunately, even in a couple of parliamentary reports, that somehow the UK leaving the EU automatically meant the death of the common travel area as a matter of EU law, that Ireland somehow wasn't allowed to continue the common travel area, or at least not to do so without the full consent of all of the other member states. Um, now, that argument was always, was always totally phony. Um, it's obvious that the withdrawal of the UK cannot affect the entirely separate sovereign rights and obligations of Ireland as a full member state in its own right under the treaties and the treaties are utterly clear on this. Ireland in the negotiating directives which were adopted just earlier this week, clear as day, 
the EU will respect any bilateral agreements or arrangements such as the common travel area between Ireland and the UK. So as a matter of EU law, the problem has totally disappeared. The real problem still remains UK law because we have no idea what the UK's future immigration policy is going to be. Now, the way that the, way that the common travel area works, the common travel area is basically a mini Schengen. That's all it is. It's a, it's a mini Schengen area. And the way that any common travel area works, whether it's Schengen or the one between the UK and Ireland, is that you construct sufficiently coordinated external <coughs> border controls so as everyone within the zone feels comfortable about getting rid of the internal border controls. Because you basically know that no matter where you try to enter the territory from, you're pretty much being treated in the same way. And then once you're inside, you can move around at will without having to worry about it. That's worked fine between the UK and Ireland because we're both members of the EU and both uh, closely aligned our policies on third country nationals, non-EU non, non nationals. If in the future the UK keeps immigration rules for the rest of the world, which are roughly the same as they are now, the system can take a bit of tolerance, then there's no problem. If the UK adopts appreciably more restrictive immigration rules, either for EU nationals or for anyone else in the world, then the system comes under pressure. And that's when you have what we call the problem of the soft underbelly. The UK puts more restrictions in place, Ireland either won't or, or can't, and then you can enter Ireland and then circulate into the UK, and that becomes a problem. Now, we don't know the scale of the problem yet because we don't know what the UK's immigration system is going to be. In principle, there are three solutions for Ireland. Scotland, different matter altogether if they go independent. One solution is that you abandon the common travel area and you reintroduce persons checks between Ireland and the UK in general, Ireland and Northern Ireland in particular. Logistical nightmare and politically a real provocation to nationalists in Northern Ireland. Second solution is you maintain a common travel area on the island of Ireland, but you introduce persons checks between Ireland and the UK. Logistically much more feasible in the sense that you more or less have to show a passport to get on an airplane anyway, and if you just do the same for boats, well, not such a big deal. Um, but obviously a real political provocation for unionists in Northern Ireland. The final solution is the UK just has to swallow the fact that people might enter Ireland and then come to England, Wales or Scotland who wouldn't have got in if it weren't for the common travel area. And the UK just has to get better at enforcing its own immigration restrictions, whether through employment, access to housing, landlords, employers, and so on. That's the only real workable solution, I think, is that we just have to make our own immigration regime work better and live with the consequences. The real danger, I think, for something like the common travel area isn't that that isn't workable, it is workable. The real danger is, I think, that, that it only really takes one murderer or rapist to come from Dublin into <coughs> England to commit some horrible crime before the Daily Express and the Daily Mail will start screeching about the soft underbelly. And these things aren't just about rational, legal and political frameworks. A lot of these things, as we've learned, are about irrational um, demagoguery. And I think, in a way, for me, that's the real risk to the future of the common travel area is uh, the Daily Express and the Daily Mail. The gentleman there. Yeah, yeah uh, thank you. I, I really enjoyed your talk. It was particularly powerful when you were describing the massive volume and complexity of all the renegotiations that have got to, be, that, that, that have got to happen. Uh, can you comment on, on the view, on those who take some reassurance from the view, that the only possible way of dealing with that is to leave the vast majority of it in place. And if we do that, then it's possible to at least imagine a future where we're a semi-detached neighbour with a reasonably positive relationship. Uh, I, I, if, the, if your answer to that, for whatever reason, is not really, then is it more or less inevitable that, that the UK will finish up as a, a Singapore? Uh, as you also outlined, a, a sweatshop on the border, competing in the only way it possibly can. 
I, is it inevitable? No, of, of course not. Th these are all political choices. Um, it, it's not that it's inevitable, it's that there is a substantial proportion of a major political party and a few minor political parties not far behind um, that, that positively want that. They positively want it. It's what they think the future of the country should be. Um, they genuinely believe that cutting corporate taxes, slashing employment rights, denying climate change, getting rid of what they see as PC red tip, um, will free the UK um, to be the country that it should be. Um, I, I don't share any of those <laughs> views or visions, um, but it's not inevitable. That this, is a, this is now about a political battle, I think, for what we want this country to be in the future. I think the thing that changes is that leaving the EU opens up possibilities for that vision of our country that aren't compatible with EU membership. The EU is very clearly based on a social market economy which is committed to high standards of worker protection in the fields that the EU has regulatory competence over, let's not forget that, is committed to the maintenance of welfare states which are sustainable but offer protection to the most vulnerable in society, you know, all of the things that we associate with European values. Um, but a lot of people don't share those and they see leaving the EU as a milestone in transforming this country into something very different. There's one there on the on the left, and then after that, the man, the, the gentleman at the front, and after that, the, the gentleman right at the back. <laughs> okay, so we we'll start over there. Thank you. Um, I apologise for bringing this down to personalities, but I feel I've got to get it off my chest. Every time I listen to David Davis or uh, David Jones, who is Cluid West's MP and apparently is doing all sorts of things making trade deals right, left and centre, and <laughs> Liam Fox. I am left with the impression these people are deeply out of their depth, but they won't yeah. admit it. Mm. At what point do you think somebody is going to, to use young people's vernacular, man up and say, actually, we're in a mess? Or is their vanity, as you talk about, so powerful that they won't do that? I think somebody identified as a psychiatrist <laughs> before. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, psychiatrist, psychiatrist. But, um, we can only speculate as to what goes on in their heads. Um, <laughs> and that, and that, but that's a serious answer because one of the things that really really, really struck me is that, um, y you know when, when people say, um, both in the UK, the, 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 the lawyers, um, but also, you know, virtually every major political actor in Europe, as well as all of the lawyers there, saying to the government, you can't have a trade deal until you're a third country. That's the way the system works. The government's response, we want a trade deal before we leave. You can't have that. We want it. You can't have it. We want it. <laughs> um, we're calling an election on that basis and we're, we're going to show that a bigger majority in the House of Commons will show you that you have to do this. You can't have it. Um, Tory manifesto, we're going to do this. You, you can't. Um, th there comes a point when you do have to wonder whether it's arrogance, ignorance or some combination of both. And I suspect it's some combination of both. There was one. Yep. Yeah. So let's pretend that Mrs May gets a similar majority that she has currently got. We're three months down the line, maybe four months. David Davis is somewhere talking to the EU <laughs> and uh, he doesn't like what he's hearing. He's not liked what he's hearing for the last several weeks. He makes a call to Mrs May and she says, walk out. Could you explain the legal and, and consequences of the UK saying, if you don't like what we're offering, then we'll stuff your deals, we will just walk out, no money, and we'll go to WTO. Okay. Um, 
I should preface that by saying that my, my own estimate is that there's a 50-50 chance that that's exactly what's going to happen. And in fact, I'd go so far as to say that um, I've got a lingering suspicion, which is based on the idea that it's the only rational explanation for their behavior. But I admit I'm giving them more credit than they probably deserve <laughs> by trying to think about rational explanations. The only rational explanation for their behavior over the past several months is that that's exactly what they're planning on doing. And actually, they're planning it. They're, they're, they've realized how much they've messed up. They realize that their plan is in tatters. What do they do? They whip up a load of nationalistic sentiment in a general election, and they lay the groundwork for blaming the foreigners for punishing poor little Britain when things go wrong. They're never going to get what it is they've set out to achieve. They, they're never going to get it. So maybe it's better just to suffer the consequences. Now, that's the rational explanation. It doesn't take account of the arrogant stroke ignorance and the effect <laughs> that it has upon people's mental stability. Um, but, I, but, but I think it's a 50-50 chance that that's what does ultimately happen. You know, um, the, the question then is, what, what, what's the consequence? Well, um, again, there's lots of pieces on the chessboard. Does it mean that they're just going to sit in London huffing until the two-year deadline expires and nothing happens in the meantime? That, that would just be weird. Um, does it mean that they just say, we're right unilaterally and catastrophically for all concerned? Um, so, so there is that important question. But when it comes to the sort of big list of issues that we mentioned before, um, the rights of citizens, the financial liabilities, the ongoing procedures, the Euratom, um, uh, uh, you know, more, way more than a dozen major issues that need to be solved, uh, no one in their right mind would not want to reach agreement on those things because the degree of disruption and damage that that will cause to millions of people uh, cannot possibly justify walking away from the negotiating table. If they do anyway, um, then it means, of course, that both sides just have to unilaterally try and solve the problems as best they can. Um, that will be messy, it will be disruptive, it will be damaging, but they just have to unilaterally do it. For the longer term, the issues which aren't on the mechanics negotiating table, um, it, it will be a major rupture in this country's position in the world. Um, and not just in relation to trade and the WTO, um, security cooperation, defense cooperation, um, environmental cooperation, fisheries, uh, in, in almost every conceivable sector of our economy and society, um, it would be an unprecedented rupture. They, maybe, maybe we should hope that they're not rational. <laughs> um, because if, if that's the only explanation, it, it means that, the, that we're not looking in a very positive place. The gentleman right at the back there. Next. I would like to uh, continue the discussion on your vaguely positive uh, note at the end. Uh, you, you, were, you were saying that uh, you believe that a lot of the, the Leave voters are actually decent people who were conned. Um, that, that could be a basis for trying to persuade them to change their mind. Now, my perception of the Leave voters is a little bit different. And my perception is that there are two types. The one type is the type that actually believes the uh, common narrative that Britain is superior, that Britain is strong, that Britain deserves a place in the world where everyone basically falls about and says, yes, you can get what you like. And I think there's quite a lot of people who actually believe that because they've been fed this common narrative for a very, very long time, partly to do with the education system, but mostly to do with the press, uh, which is so monopolized, but you've mentioned that already. Now, the other type is, f uh, and I'm talking from personal experience here, actually racist. They want it out because they don't want foreigners. And that is what they are. And I base that on comments I've heard from colleagues, comments I've heard in work, comments I've heard from people, and also the fact that how they treated people who didn't look white enough after the referendum. And I've got a lot of friends who were directly exposed to that. So 
my analysis of what the Leave voters are like isn't necessarily a, a group of decent people who were conned. And in fact, the first group would very much feel insulted if you told them that they were conned. They would say, but we looked at all the facts and we decided to leave. Well, I looked on the government website and within five minutes I knew that the 350 a week was a lie. Mm -hmm. But they would say, well, that doesn't matter to us because that's not because why we voted out. So I think we've got two really big issues here if we want to persuade people to, to change their mind. Because I think one lot is racist and the other lot has a narrative that sees Britain as seriously superior. I mean, if you disagree, then that's fine, but it's... Um, I think what, what I said was that there are, there are, there are two groups of Leave voters. Um, I put them in slightly different ways from you, but I think we're essentially saying the same thing, but we're not maybe agreeing on relative proportions. Um, I, I call the first group the zombie army. <laughs> and in the zombie army, I would include the, the racists. And the, but but I, I, maybe I'm very naive, but I'm not just speaking from naivety. I don't think 52% of the population are zombie racists. I just don't. And more importantly, um, my own experience of being involved in a lot of um, events, public events and so on, is actually exactly what I said in my talk. Um, the great majority of people who I met, including the ones who voted leave, were just trying to do the best thing that they could possibly do for their families, their society, their country. Many of them did not want to make this decision. Many of them said very openly, I don't want to have to make this choice. This is why I vote for Parliament, so as people can make this choice for me. But now that I'm being forced to make it, I'm going to make it with the information which is available to me. And whether we like it or not, much of the information was, was a total pack of lies. Of course it was. But, but maybe I'll push back even a little further and say that um, I think probably the most unrewarding events which I did in the sense that I, you know, I met a relatively higher proportion of people who um, didn't like Muslims and thought that voting leave would help get rid of the Muslims um, were, were, were very often um, middle class people who had no apparent worries in the world. There was nothing to suggest that life had been desperately cruel and alienating to them. Th they were just bigots and they were really unpleasant bigots. But at the other end, many of the most interesting, rewarding, inspiring events which I participated in, participated in, participated in, um, were in community centres, in working class parts of Liverpool, Manchester and so on, where you had people who may not have had many advantages in life, who may not have had brilliant levels of education, um, but they were confused, they felt disoriented about what was expected of them because they heard all of these different things and they just wanted to know what was the best thing to do for their family and their country. And I think it would be very unfair if they, if they ultimately went and voted leave to portray them as being ignorant or racist or having a, uh, an overly inflated view of the world. I, I think the leave vote was a very complex, complicated phenomenon and I don't think it feels right to reduce it to that. And I'll tell you about, well actually I'll mention the group of people who probably irritate me the most of the lot and that's the so-called left-wing leavers. Um, yeah. Because uh, and the number of times which, you know, um, I, I, I pointed out, um, so the right wing say that the EU is a socialist conspiracy to destroy capitalism. Um, how can you as a left wing say that the EU is a capitalist conspiracy to destroy socialism? You can't both be right. <laughs> and you are the very junior partner in what is effectively a right wing political movement. Um, and listening to what they had to say was every bit as dishonest, as corrupt, as intellectually bankrupt, and as misleading as anything coming out of the mouth of UKIP or Boris Johnson. Um, so I don't disagree that there are groups of people within the Leave campaign or the Leave voters um, who should, we should be very critical of. I would include the left-wing Leavers among them. But I certainly wouldn't go so far as to say that 52% of the population are irretrievably lost to, to, to society.
No, I know you won't, but you know what I mean. I know what you mean. You, 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 or rather, you know what I mean. Oh, sorry. Oh, well, I, oh, no, you, yeah, I have okay. a mic, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we double mic <mic'd. laughs> Not sure what would happen there. So um, uh, a number of us in the room here were, were campaigning during the referendum. And, and my, my observations you know, that, uh, are very similar to, to, to Professor Duggan's. We, um, we met many people who were out and out bigots and racists. And we met many people who were out uh, and out uh, nationalists um, who believed that Britain had a greater, greater place in the world than and was given to us and that we had a right to be on our own and somehow were culturally superior to everybody else. But we also met a large number of people, I echo what Professor Duggan says here, who were confused. And once you spent a little bit of time talking to them and, and just blowing away all the myths and nonsense and the lies, could see, that, could see it for what it was. But they were fed that day in, day out by whatever newspaper or whatever journalism they, they they whatever media they got their they got their information from so if they, they were buying one of the the sun or the express or the the, the the mail that's what they were they were fed but you could you could blow that away quite quickly but unfortunately you know 12 people on the street in Llangollen can't turn the tide of what's happened and it's going to take a long time I think for us to get back out there and engage we've taken a blow and I think everyone felt that after the referendum and I'm, I'm sure most people in this room are very depressed and probably kept quite a low profile, or possibly became very aggressive about it. But some of it, it was a mixture of the two. But we have to get back out and engage with people and talk to them in a rational and calm manner and explain to them what we're at danger of, of losing. And explain to them about these lies. But we have to be very careful that we don't make these people feel somehow stupid or ignorant. Um, and that's a difficult task, but we need to do it. Okay, uh, we'll, we'll do a sensible lap round with the microphone. Okay. So we'll, we'll sort of go diagonally up, starting there. Yeah. Oh, sorry, yeah, the, the, yeah, that probably makes sense logistically. Yeah. Uh, it carries on from the last point, really, and it's to everybody on the panel. It seems to me that if we have any grounds for optimism at all, it's with the vote of the young people. And what worries me is that young people appear to be less and less engaged in politics. How, how do we stop them being apathetic? A lot of them are not even registering to vote when they can. Mm. Well, from, from this position here, I can see the demographic of the room and it, and, and it reflects quite broadly the demographic of most of the events we've held, unfortunately. Apart from a core group in the middle there, keeping, <laughs> keeping our average age down, which is brilliant. And I think this is something we're struggling to do, as, is to reach out to younger people. Uh, you know, I think maybe we, we've just got, we're, you know, I'm 40 years old and I, I can barely remember what it was like to be a student. I have no idea what, what makes younger people tick anymore. I thought I did until I got involved in this and I realised I was totally out of the, <laughs> totally out of the loop and, and, and quite often wasn't talking the same language. But we need to engage. Um, we, we've had some conversations with the student union at Bangor. Um, obviously, we're, we're involved here at Glyndor. Um, we're desperate to set up groups with students in these areas and get more young people involved absolutely because the danger is um i think from 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 your question earlier about the demographics and young people voting you've got to bear in mind that the press now are going to be putting out lots of stuff about how europe is doing us down and how the foreigners are destroying our country and destroying our chances in the world and you've only got to say a lie so many times before it starts to drip feed into people so we have to strike while the iron's hot while those people that are positively pro-European and desperately disappointed about leaving, while they're still keen, we need to get out and engage with those people now. Um, um, first of all, in terms yeah. of motivation, people, um, I was out with Silas campaign on a number of occasions, and I think um, I think one of the key things is about like how referenda work and what people think about it. So there's a view that came across from some people of, well, it can't be as bad as you say it will be, because if it was, then they wouldn't have given us this choice. <laughs> and there was a genuine view, not just one person, but people thinking, you know, they've given us this choice and therefore it must be kind of reasonable and we can choose which way to go. I think the other thing is that leaders tend to be the ones asking the question and people are actually in a position of, well, am I going to support them? So I think there was 
you know, there's a real issue of people feeling left behind and they were being offered a choice between the status quo, which has been pretty rubbish for a lot of working people over the last few, 10 years, you know, <coughs> static um, family incomes or even going down. And therefore, actually, when they were being asked by David Cameron whether they wanted to back him, they were saying no, and they were saying they were willing to try something else. And I think we need to recognise that that's actually what was going through people's heads and then think about how we deal with that. Because I share the ambition that actually in the long run, however it is, whatever the EU is, whatever else is, we need to re-engage with the world. We're going to need to move away from being this little Britain idea that we're doing it on our own. We'll want to re-engage. But we're not actually going to be able to do that until we've per persuaded a majority of people that that's the right way. Whether it's a referendum again, and I personally would prefer never to have another referendum, <laughs> or whether it's simply actually electing a government which is clear about its ambition and how that's going to work. Um, so I think that's my perspective on where that's at. In terms of the question, I think um, uh, what Professor Duggan was, was saying about kind of the options, um, something earlier hit me, uh, is that what you seem to be saying is that the only interim deal that would be on the table is really continuing to operate on the existing rules. And I thought there's a couple of bits in terms of this scenario where negotiations are going nowhere and what it is that we might be campaigning on or talking about. First is it strikes me that actually one of the issues for the Tories and the, the Kippers is, is we ain't paying you any money and, and that that's kind of their starting point. I mean, I don't really understand their perspective on negotiations, but it seemed to me almost like <laughs> if they've got a game theory, it's that we stand back and say, well, we're fine. What do you want? <laughs> and then when they say, well, we'd like freedoms, and say, well, you're going to have to pay for it. Not, not going to agree to that. Without... So there is a bit here about actually these bills which need to be settled. Presumably, actually, the courts will enforce that we will have to pay the money that we owe. So actually walking out of the deal and saying, fine, we're not having an agreement, isn't an option from the perspective of settling our bills. And the second one is, you know, actually, if, if the answer is, look, it's going to take a really long time to, to negotiate a future arrangement, then the only rational basis you seem to be saying is that we should be saying, well, OK, fine, so we should agree to remain in the, current, in, in the uh, customs union and the single market until such time as we've uh, uh, concluded the negotiations. Do you want to respond straight away? And then after that, well, the gentleman who's mm -hmm. been waiting a long time. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think, I mean, I, I think in a way your observation goes back to the gentleman's question here. Um, I think the bill, um, as it's being whipped up in the right wing media and by UKIP and the right wing Tories, is about looking for excuses to be able to walk out of the negotiations full stop. Um, the bill could be a fiver and they'd still say <laughs> they, they, they didn't want to pay it. Um, I, I think that the, in terms of sort of, you know, the, 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 there's two issues here. I think one is about the manifesto promises of the parties other than the Tories about the deal. Um, and the second is sort of how do we bridge a, a longer term gap, um, which is more directly your question. Um, I think Labour and the Lib Dems, to a degree, have suffered a little bit from listening too much from the government because they're still um, talking about, you know, looking at the deal which is on offer in, in 18 months' time. Um, the Lib Dems wanting to hold a referendum on that deal and if not to remain. Um, and I think those types of promises and those types of um, discussions are still presupposing that this deal is going to be anything more than an incredibly tedious long list of technical adjustments to making an orderly withdrawal actually happen. It's not going to be the new relationship between the UK and the EU. It's not going to be um, any of the things which seem to be in their imagination. Now, in a way, for the Lib Dems, that could actually positively play under their hand because what they're going to say is we're offering a referendum on either leaving the EU and stepping into WTO and a void or staying in the EU. Um, and in that case, you know, yeah, vote stay. <laughs> um, but, but, but I think there's still a bit of confusion among some of the other political parties about where these negotiations are heading and the time scales they're, they're heading towards um, because they've let the government set the agenda. The problem with sort of the, the longer term, why don't we just keep things as they are um, for as long as we can? Well, there are legal problems and political problems. The political problem is that the, the European Council has said that any transitional arrangements have to be for a strictly limited period of time. The European Parliament has gone further and said maximum three years. 
three years for transitional periods, but no longer than that. So there's a political issue that the EU itself is saying, this can't last forever. We can't just carry on as if you haven't left yet. There are also legal issues in the sense that the, 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 there's maybe a bit of a m misunderstanding about what belonging to a customs union or a single market involves. It's not just about having the same rules. It's about being fully integrated into networks of political, administrative, judicial decision-making, cooperation, information sharing. And you can only be in those networks if you're basically in the EU or something almost equivalent to the EU, like the EEA. If we're not willing to sign up to all of those things, we can't be in the customs union in the single market. So there are sort of technical legal limitations as well. I think part of the problem here, and this comes back to the very start of your question, is that which country in its right mind would have called such a fundamental referendum about its future without any preparations, without any idea of what the alternatives are, without conducting any um, real work into where we might be instead. Um, you know, people criticize Article 50 and say, you know, it only gives two years to sort these issues out. Maybe Article 50 was drafted on the basis that no country would be so stupid <laughs> as to behave the way we have done and not have even the slightest clue what was coming next. Two years would have been an adequate period of time for a country that knew what it was doing. It's not an adequate period of time for a country which hadn't, its civil service was actively told not to make preparations for a leave victory. In a way, you can't blame the rest of the EU for saying, you should have thought about all this before you voted out. Good evening, thank you very much for your talk. It's very interesting. Um, I've worked for the last 30 years in manufacturing in the UK, and for 25 of those years, for companies from outside the UK that have brought investment here. So 10 years in South Wales working for Bosch, and uh, latterly 15 years working for Toyota in, uh, here in North Wales. I'm very concerned about the idea that um, after we leave the EU, that somehow these companies will continue to invest in this country. Um, I'm, I'm very conscious of the fact that Toyota is working very hard to challenge and maintain a cost-competitive position and maintain long-term production in the UK. And I'm actively supporting that through uh, my work because I'm currently based in Brussels and working around Europe in the different plants. However, I think if we end up in a situation where we have trade tariffs for goods coming to the UK to, go built, to be built into cars, trade tariffs for vehicles to go back to Europe or to, to go to elsewhere in the world, I think the, the gap that we're going to have to close in terms of costs will, will affect the long-term sustainability of that business. And I suspect for many other businesses as well around, uh, around the country. The other concern I have is that if, when I go to places like Poland, anyway, they have European rules and regulations, but they have a different structure in terms of wage levels and uh, there's a lot of support for companies to inward invest into those areas. And I think um, any company wanting to come to Europe in the future will simply look to Eastern Europe for investment and bring work there rather than bring it to the UK. Already the plant in South Wales has closed, the Bosch plant, mm. and sadly relocated to Hungary. Mm. And I think this is, you know, I do, I worry for our young people. Not everyone wants to be a banker or work in service industries. You know, manufacturing is not the biggest um, economic activity in the country, but I think it's a very important one. And I, I've, I'm always very sad when I see what Germany does and how they manage and compare it to what we've done. You know, we've killed our manufacturing industry in this country. It sort of isn't, it, it isn't, I mean, it, in a way it's, um, I think in some respects the challenges facing manufacturers are easier than the challenges facing service industries and in some respects they're more difficult. Um, it, there will be the question of tariffs, there will be the question of, you know, the, the <coughs> customs formalities and so on. Um, but otherwise, as long as you're able and willing to manufacture your goods in accordance with European standards and place them on the European market, um, your market access is more costly, it's more difficult, it's more cumbersome, but your market access isn't sort of entirely prohibited, for example. Um, 
tariffs are obviously a major concern, but, but, but your, your market access isn't necessarily uh, entirely prohibited. Um, in a way, for services, it's almost the other way around. Services don't need to worry about tariffs. Services need to worry about just not having market access at all because you're not allowed to provide your services in that territory unless you're resident there, you're registered there, you're supervised there, and so on. So I think the two major parts of the economy will face very different um, problems. But I think in a way your question comes back to the last couple of questions as well. One, one of my, well, a, a good friend of mine works in financial services. And again, I get the feeling over the last couple of months that they're really regretting having believed the government because they sat there thinking, okay, there'll be a trade deal. Nothing much is going to change. The government is saying it's going to get us more or less the same market access for services as we have at the moment. Suddenly then the regulator said, we need your contingency plans for the no deal default to zero situation. And we need them by, I think it's either June or July. I can't remember the date he told me. Um, and suddenly they're getting around in working groups and realizing that um, large parts of their business may no longer be sustainable. And bloody hell did they wish that they hadn't listened to the government. So I, I wouldn't like to sort of <coughs> pit manufacturing again, I think we're, it, almost every part of the economy is going to face very different problems. Um, and manufacturing's problems will be different from services, but they'll certainly face um, major ones. Time for a few more questions. Um, gentleman in the middle, right in the middle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. as well, there's some incentive to achieve some kind of a deal. Um, what I'm not clear about is purely from a technical perspective, ignoring the politics for a minute, what is achievable in 18 months? <laughs> <laughs> um, the best thing I can do is, is say re read the European Council guidelines because you know the, 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 the European Union, by the way when I say this uh, and if there are any um, sort of leave MPs or anything in the room, um, they'll sort of scoff and dismiss it as absolute rubbish. Um, the, the EU is, <laughs> and we've been part of it, um, one of the most experienced and sophisticated trade negotiators on the planet. Um, it knows how to do this because it's what it does every day of its life. It does it between the member states within the single market. It does it with dozens of countries across the planet. It knows what's realistic. It knows what needs to be done. It knows the types of time skills and challenges that you have to address. The European Council has set out what it knows needs to be done and you read it and basically if you'd gotten together a group of 10 EU specialists around a table, they could have written that document um, in any combination. And they've set out what they think is realistic in the time frame and what's realistic is we'll start provisional preparatory talks about what a future trade relationship might look like. That's as good as we're going to get. And it does mean that we will be leaving with, at best, certain transitional provisions in place. We're not going to be leaving with a clear future relationship set out for us. And that's why, you know, <coughs> things like WTO tariffs are things that people have to be seriously thinking about. Because unless they do manage to strike a provisional deal to suspend all customs enforcement between the two territories, that seems pretty unlikely to me. Um, there will be a uh, fracturing between the UK and the EU in customs terms. And under WTO law, that's not a matter of discretion or, or, or anything. You have to apply the same tariffs to every member of the WTO as you apply to every other member, unless you've got a special deal in place which says otherwise. So it's not a matter of discretion or anything. If we leave without a proper deal in place, the WTO requires both sides to apply their tariffs to each other. Okay. We're going to have about five minutes or so left. So what I'd like to do, I know there are still a few people who want to come in. If we take all the questions and comments in succession, and if we can just maybe hold them and then we'll wrap up um, by trying to respond briefly. So if you could keep your questions brief. Um, I'll just remind me again. So yeah, this gentleman here at the front has been waiting for a little while. And then we'll go to the lady in the middle. Um, I, the I did actually yeah. put this in an e in the email to, Sorry, to yes. you collectively. I don't know if it got forwarded to you or not. 
There's a Leave website, eureferendum.com, and there's a guy there who makes comments all the time. And basically, he thinks the hard Brexit is total suicide, right? And his view is that we should in go interim to an EEA arrangement with a view that we would move on from that to gradually move away as the economy copes and with the various transitions. My real question is, is the stuff he puts on the website actually realistic, or is he just talking through his hat? If you've actually looked at it, and is that actually a viable possibility? Uh, that, you know, if it may not be a political possibility, but if it is, it a possibility in terms of you know that would work, and it would be relatively safe. Thank you. The lady in the middle. Yeah. Yeah. There is someone prepared, as far as I can see, as this um, what looks like chaos hits in, in, in many different places at once. There actually is a woman who has a plan, and that's got to be Nicola Sturgeon, okay, with at least, with a plan at least to keep Scotland within the EU and at least a place for professionals and businesses and anyone else to go as England and Wales continues with this madness, political madness. I, there is at least a, 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 someone has a plan and it's the SNP right now. The gentleman at the back, and then we'll, we'll finish up at the front, and then uh, wrap up for the... <laughs> oh, <laughs> sorry. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to come back to Professor Duggan's um, reasons to be cheerful, because I kind of stick my ears up at that point. Um, and I, I mean, I kind of like, I like the idea that in, maybe in 20 or 30 years' time, we might be looking at uh, uh, re-entering the, 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 uh, the EU. Um, I like it, but I'm probably not going to be here to see it, so it's not a <laughs> real consolation. Uh, but, but, but having said that, um, I do seriously wonder, um, and I say this, I ask this question as a, as a committed uh, Remainer, I seriously wonder, given the rise of populism and the hard right, the hard right politics across Europe as witnessed by the, you know, the, um, the, the, the French uh, presidential election and other events in Europe, will there be an EU to rejoin? <laughs> Okay, we had a lady here with the in the middle row. Yeah. Okay, it's a slight change of tack. Um, following the awful events in Manchester on Monday, um, our intelligence situation with the United States has unravelled. Um, and, and we, they are no longer to be trusted with information. Um, Amber Rudd, the Home Secretary, on the 27th of March, said that it was likely that we would be leaving Europol. Um, we are going to be incredibly isolated in intelligence terms, in tackling terrorism and, and being aware of the threats. And I think that's a very frightening situation to be in. There was one, there was, I think there was one at the front here, yeah. So we'll finish up with the final, and then we'll go back again to Professor Duggan. <laughs> no, <I'm talking laughs> <a bit> right. <laughs> this, this was a question about defaulting to WTO rules, because I'd understood there was a potential problem in countries such as Argentina and Spain with territorial disputes with Britain blocking it. Okay, so... We're going to uh, hand the unenviable task to Professor Dung to wrap up all of those. <laughs> quite, quite a lot of different questions. Okay, I'll try, I'll try and run through them uh, yeah. as quickly as I can. Um, EUreferendum.com. Um, uh, I've, got, I've got a particular bugbear about this, so I, shouldn't, I wouldn't want to not say it. Um, Richard North, who's the author of referendum, EUreferendum.com, is one of the main originators of the uh, libelous um, stories which circulate by the tens of thousands on the internet about how I am paid by the EU and I'm an EU propagandist and I'm funded by the EU and all the rest of it. Um, <laughs> listen, R R Richard North is a, is a relatively well-known um, right-wing journalist um, who's a, I think he's sort of a part-time climate change denier, a long-term Europhobe. Um, from what I can make out, he has no legal qualifications, experience, skills, or any other relevant legal anything, but he's appointed himself as a sort of guru 
of EEA law um, and made some really, really quite peculiar arguments about the UK's relationship to the EEA. Um, one of the joys of my job is that I meet a lot of lawyers from a lot of other countries um, and, you know, in between conference papers we can have a little chat about these things. Um, and I can guarantee you that, that one of the main things that the EEA lawyers love to do is to read for a laugh Richard North's latest musings on the UK's relationship to the EEA. Um, listen, it, North's argument was that somehow, the, if I've picked it up correctly because it's difficult to follow, um, that, um, that somehow the UK would automatically stay in the EEA um, despite leaving the EU and that this was um, potentially an excellent deal because we could reject the free movement of people and you know reject the EU institutions and have all the benefits of the single market without the real burdens. Um, I, I, again, I've said it before, I've never met a single um, lawyer who actually knows what they're talking about who thinks that's anything other than bonkers. Um, and this is part of the problem of this entire debate is that self-appointed um, bigots uh, sold the public a pack of lies um, and now he's, you know, attacking the hard Brexiteers as vehemently as anybody else. Well, sorry, mate, you did a lot of the damage here and it's a bit too late to start trying to undo it. Um, on Nicola Sturgeon, um, I, I agree entirely. I was, I think I mentioned before, I was at a, a big event in Edinburgh, um, I think it was last week. Um, the contrast between the preparation, the rigor, the understanding, the openness, the debate of the Scottish government and civil service versus the closed, ignorant, non-listening incompetence of Westminster was staggering. It really, really struck me just how in control of the issues that the Scottish government is. Um, they've got two major problems, of course. First of all, Westminster needs to let them have the referendum, and secondly, they've got to win it. <laughs> and those are both major <coughs> problems for different reasons, but I'd certainly endorse the point that you're making that, um, in a way, Nicola Sturgeon is holding up an example of how a competent, open-minded government should tackle the future of its country as compared to, to London. Um, will there be an EU in 20 or 30 years' time? Um, uh, to coin a phrase, if the EU didn't exist, we'd have to invent it because the simple reality for every European country, Germany, France, the UK, as much as Malta, Slovenia or Latvia, is that to try and survive in the world on your own as a small European country, and we're all small in the big scheme of things, is madness. So it doesn't matter what form the EU takes, it doesn't matter what we call it, it doesn't matter what basis it has, what, you know, all of those things, there will be an EU. Um, it's just a matter of how it evolves and how it adapts to the challenges that European countries face in a very volatile and unstable world. Of course there will be an EU. Um, in terms of sort of the, 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 the situation with Europol and the European arrest warrant, um, in a way I think the, the, the most useful reference point we have was provided by the coalition government. Um, at the time when the UK ex exercised its opt-out, which it was given under the Lisbon Treaty to reject um, all of the EU's previous criminal cooperation and security cooperation measures and then selectively opt back into them. The UK government made the argument as a, and it was endorsed by every other major player in the field um, that participation in these institutions and instruments is absolutely essential to the security interests of the UK. That hasn't changed. The difficulty is that the legal framework which governs participation in these absolutely essential security and cooperation instruments is not the same for a non-member state as it is for a member state. And the simple fact is, if you're not part of the EU system, you can never have as close cooperation as if you are. So there will be losses. There is a common interest in minimizing those losses, but there, there will be losses. And we can look at the example of sort of Norway and Iceland as an example. Norway and Iceland can't be part of the European arrest warrant because only member states can be part of the European arrest warrant. They signed an international agreement with the EU, I can't remember when it was, about 10 years ago, um, to create more or less the equivalent of a European arrest warrant. Not quite so fast, not quite so unqualified, it had its limitations, but they signed the agreement. It's still not in force. It still hasn't entered into force. That's international relations, you know, that's how, the, that's how it works. Um, in terms of defaulting to WTO issues, WTO rules, um, I'm not a WTO lawyer, so I'm not going to pretend to know the details of this, but the stuff which I'm told by my colleagues is 
there is a distinction between stuff which can be done relatively easily, which is basically copying and pasting over your tariff systems, and that can be done relatively easily, and actually dividing up your tariff quotas. In other words, you've got a system which says you, the EU, collectively can export you know, 10,000 tonnes of beef to Argentina. The EU has <coughs> those quotas. We have to ask the EU to be nice to us and give us some of those quotas because otherwise we don't have any. And it's in issues like that where then there's the potential for either the EU or other members of the WTO to say, hang on a minute, we don't agree. Give us sovereignty over the Falkland Islands and we'll be more amenable to reaching an agreement, but we don't agree. The problem is that nobody really knows how this is going to play out. It only takes some countries to form a coalition that want to make it highly political, and it will become highly political. But again, this is the reality of international relations. This is what we were promised by the Leave campaign. We were promised that we would stand on our own in the world and triumph in all of these situations. And the reality, of course, is that international politics is, is a dirty, dirty game dictated by power. So we'll find out the answers. Thank you very much. With that, let's give Professor Dougal a warm round of applause. word to Silas. It's for me, thank you all for coming. Um, I've thoroughly enjoyed it and um, you must be really, really committed and engaged to stay here in this heat for so long. <laughs> well done. <laughs> Silas. So very quickly, I'd just like to say a few thank yous. Thank you again f to all, you all of you for coming. Thank you to Professor Duggan for taking time out of his, of his day to come here today. Um, thank you, a massive thank you to Glyndore University and Maria and all her team for allowing us to use this facility. Uh, thank you to the to the tech guys stood here. Um, we've got uh, Colin, David, and Scott, and Michael. I think Michael was the chat with the boom. Um, poor old Scott um, is going to be in uh, going to be in trouble. Is it Scott? No, uh, Colin. You'll be late for the barbecue with your wife. You're in big trouble. <laughs> so a big thank you to all of you for doing this for us today. And uh, North Wales Fury will be carrying out, will be hosting more events over the coming uh, months and years. Probably this is going to be a long process and we're going to carry on carry on the good fight and, and and trying to hold these these people who the brexiteers to account for what they've done and trying to get the message across and that's the important thing to try and get the positive message across of what the eu has done for us and why we should stay or alternatively go back in so if you are interested and you want to find out more about what we're doing please sign up outside and thank you again for coming thanks Alex. thank you, thank you.